آه الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد آه All praises due to Allah May Allah's peace and blessings be upon his prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Sorry for uh, the delay uh, today and uh, also for the technical uh, uh, troubleshooting um, Inshallah we continue our class uh, Wednesday with the sisters and we are still with the book of the ideal muslima uh, according to the Quran and the Sunnah uh, Subhanallah it is very very important to keep uh, to, to uh, keep reminding each other that our base and our foundation and our limits always according to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this relieves us from all the stress of having uh, personal conflicts and social burdens because if you uh, go according to one way there will be always an opposite way to it I want something you want something this organization wants something and that organization wants the opposite my neighbor wants this while well, I want that and uh, there will always be a conflict uh, but whenever we all agree that we all go back to the Quran the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we will all be relieved because we, there is some foundation that we will all accept, whether we like or we do not like. Uh, we talked about the relationship of the Muslim woman with Allah subhanahu wa taala. Talked about the relationship of the Muslim woman with her parents. We talked about the relationship of the Muslim woman with uh, uh, her family and now we talk about uh, we talked in general about the Muslim woman and her husband uh, marriage in Islam uh, is a sacred relationship and it is a very uh, noble and important institution uh, physical relationship financial uh, benefit uh, psychological, mental, emotional, all of those are pillars of the marriage, but they are not the marriage. Like pillars of Islam, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Islam is built o on five pillars. Uh, people forget that they are pillars. Pillars means they are not the house, but they are important for the house. But the house is something else. The house have uh, windows, have roof, have plumbing, have electricity, have furniture, have people living in it. That's what a house is. But then a home, you make out of that house, a home, a place of comfort. So you have the foundation, foundation, you have the pillars, and over these pillars comes a building. And that building is furnished, and then out of this whole thing, you can make a home or not. Is that clear, sisters? Yeah, I want you to keep that in your head all the time, because people think that the five pillars of Islam is Islam. Those are the pillars, you know. Without them, there is no Islam. But Islam is not them. Islam is not only Salah and Shahada and Hajj and Siyam. Those are the pillars. Salah will change your behavior. Zakah will change the way you think. Hajj will help you do certain things. Fasting will do. But there is furniture. There are people. There is comfort on, in, that, in that house, which is built on those pillars. But Unfortunately, we only focus on the pillars as they are the Islam, and that's it. That's why you find Muslims are not happy. That's why you find the community not functioning. That's why you find, oh, I'm praying, I'm making dua, but nothing is happening. I'm still unhappy. I'm uncomfortable. I'm miserable. Why? Because you only think pillars are Islam, but they are not Islam. So same thing, physical relationship between husband and wife is important for marriage, but that's not marriage. That's not what marriage is about. It helps you to have a successful marriage. Money transactions helps you to, having children helps you to establish a family, but that's not the family. Family is much, much bigger. When you have a unit that worships Allah Azza wa Jalla, when you have a unit that happy and sad for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, when you have everybody supporting everybody to be a good servant of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, when you sacrifice for the sake of that unit, your happiness and your comfort and all of that, then you have marriage then you have marriage. But uh, if, if we focus on one aspect 
and if it is missing then you know you are unhappy that means you don't understand what this relationship means not only marriage but in a relationship between me and my father if I think that my father is always not making me happy the way I want uh, and that is the foundation of the relationship then I'm wrong father son relationship is much much more than that okay that's why Allah Azza Jal emphasized and said your relationship with your parents is based on ihsan ihsan means you be nice to them that is the foundation not how they are to you it's you to them even if they are mushrikeen even if they are not muslims even if they are bad people as long as they are not pushing you to to be to be, to be non muslim you're fine even if they are pushing you to be non muslim allah said don't obey them but still be nice to them you see so the foundation of the relationship is not what they do to you or what you do to them that's not the foundation the foundation is obeying allah because he said be good to your parents and that's the foundation so foundation between husband and wife is that you are doing things for the sake of Allah so you can be admitted to Jannah because you are making a family who say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah me being the husband you being the wife they being the children you know the in-laws all of those but the dynamics of the family will not be the way you are pleased with for sure hundred percent there will always be issues we talk about and everything but we do not hang in there and we don't get stuck in there because once we do that then the shaitan will take over and that's why rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said dearer to shaitan shaitan loves more than killing killing a person killed one other person or adultery fornication or drinking or stealing what is dearer to shaitan than those he said yes breaking the relationship between husband and wife you might ask what really shaitan asking somebody to go and commit adultery it's a big sin but breaking between husband and wife making them divorce shaitan loves that more than pe two people committing adultery absolutely absolutely because marriage is an institution that continues don't look to the marriage now look to you have two children three children four children look at that in 50 years from now if you die while this marriage is going that means 50 years later those five kids there are five families right and out of those five families there are another five families each so two three hundred years you have hundreds hundreds of human beings who say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah and pray if you do your marriage right if you do it right if the foundation is fear of allah if you really 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 want to please allah azza wa jal then you are going to get over all these issues and 200 300 years you will have hundreds of people yawm al qiyamah day of judgment you'll have thousands of people coming and looking at you as the dad or the mom who saved all of them from hell and going to jannah wouldn't that be worth it so that's 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 why it is dearer to shaitan to break that unit because once a man and a woman divorce that's it their kids look at at them as a divorced mom and dad and grandchildren divorce grandma and granddad grandpa and a hundred years later our great great grand they were divorced it stays like that forever it's it's not like something that you can erase or change correct yeah so it's it's it, that's why it is dearer to shaitan to break that unit because that unit is big but if two people commit adultery they might repent might not but it does not make bigger damage than the damage of the uh, marriage breaking the marriage so that's why we wanted to emphasize on uh, that marriage look to the verse of Allah when he referred to marriage how did he refer to marriage Allah referred to marriage as an ayah ayah means a sign like a miracle like something big wa min ayatihi yani Allah created the mountains huge and all this is you look at it and say subhanallah you're in amazement right that's what an ayah means the word ayah ayah means verse of quran or a miraculous sign okay miraculous sign something to be uh, to 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 bring wonder to make you like marvel marvel it right so that's what a sign is ayah the word ayah means something that makes you wonder say mashallah amazing subhanallah right that's an ayah so allah called the marriage what ayah وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ and among the signs of your Lord أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا so he created to you souls uh, spouses from your own type so you can dwell into 
you see the cause or the reason of marriage now? Reason of marriage is to find comfort. Reason of marriage is to find comfort. Uh, I'd appreciate it if uh, anybody from administration listening to us to tell the people who are working to stop because, you know, they're uh, making big noise here. Uh, you know, the people who are working, so they are making noises. Um, so, uh, back to, to the verse. So, Allah Azza wa said, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهِ So now, if you want to know why we get married, it's to please Allah, right? And to please Allah, marriage has to be a source of comfort. The word sakan, sakan, seen kaf and noon, sakan means dwelling, means comfort. Sukun in Arabic means silence. The word sukun. You know in Arabic uh, you have fatha kasra dhamma, like uh, the, l the letters when you put fatha, alif fatha, a, ba, e, u, that's called haraka. Haraka means a move. But sukun, when you say ab, stop, right? Sukun, the circle that you put it over a letter, makes it a consonant. Stop. So the word sukun means silence, means there is no moving. What it means here, figure of speech, allegorically speaking, what it means is that marriage is that state of comfort. You work, you struggle, you have people against you, you're earning, you're losing, you're doing all of these things. But when you come to that institution of marriage, you'll find second. Second means dwelling, comfort. So what is, how marriage will fulfill the purpose of pleasing Allah is find the comfort. So husband and wife has to comfort each other and the children have to comfort their parents and parents have to comfort their children and everybody's comforting everybody basically. لتسكنوا إليها For you to achieve that, Allah give us two tools. Love and mercy. Love and mercy. And love is not Hollywood love. <laughs> It is not a Hollywood love, it's not the movie love, it is not the cultural love. Okay? Because you know, most of the time, whenever I ask people, they don't have a definition to what they are talking about. They don't know what they're talking about, unfortunately, you know. So when he said, so somebody said, you know, uh, you need to love each other. And you ask them, what does that mean? They will, they will just stop there and look at you. Love, you know, love, love. No, right, I, I get it, I heard you. But what does that mean? Right? Just tell me what does that mean? It's like a feeling of joy. Well, you can have a feeling of joy without loving anybody. You know? You can have a feeling of joy. You know, watching a movie, I can feel joy. Going to exercise, I can feel joy. You know, people disobey Allah and feel, feel joy. Yeah? But you have to say how you love somebody. And I'm going to teach you a drill right now. Whenever you want to define a concept, right, do one of two things. If somebody tells you, I need freedom, I need freedom, right? If your children, for example, tell you, I want my freedom. Did they use a noun or a verb? I'm asking you, did they use a noun or a verb? They use the noun, right? Right? Then ask them with a the verb. Tell them, and how one would be free. Describe how one person would be free. Okay? So that helps the person in front of you to define what they are asking. Otherwise, you say, yeah, yeah, I'm giving you freedom, and then you go somewhere else, right? Discussion will never benefit you. And it will keep repeating again. Your child will always think that you are incarcerating them, right? And you are thinking that you are giving them freedom without either of you knowing what freedom means. Okay? So they don't know what they're talking about, and you don't know what they're talking about. Right? So when somebody asks you, I need some freedom, tell them, and how would, describe to me how would a person be free? Okay? So if they, as somebody said, for example, uh, I want you, um, I want you to be just with me. I want you to be just with me. Or I want you to establish justice with me. I want you to be just with me. There is the verb here. So you, you use the noun, opposite, right? Tell them what does justice mean. So always, you know, define. So if somebody is saying like you, you are not doing such and such, ask them and how is that done? Like, you know, how is that concept done? And if something says, I want liberty, tell them and how a person would practice liberty. So this helps each other to do that. So if somebody said, you don't love me, 
right? And you say, what do you mean by love? Right? What do you mean by love? And how would one love someone else? They will give you a list. All right? Huh? It, both. It, de it depends. Like when I say, when somebody say, you do not love me, that's a verb. Right? So you say, what does love mean? You know? What do you mean by love? So tell me what love is. Then I'll know what I'm doing is right or wrong. Yeah? Because maybe they're talking about something else. Maybe they're talking about attention. About care. There's two different things. Three different things now, right? Giving someone attention doesn't mean that you care. Caring about someone, it doesn't mean you're giving them attention. Right? So caring and attention doesn't mean you love. You love somebody, not necessarily you are uh, giving attention, but you will be caring. It's, it, you know, it's just like that. So it's basically, we are in the ocean of just accusing each other without actually knowing what we're talking about. That's why Allah Azza wa defines everything for us. Tells us, always go back to Allah. Always go back and learn from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Always come back there. You will find your solution. Otherwise, you will always live in this perception of something that is not true. Something is not true. If I'm a imam and I feel, you know what? I don't feel this community respect me. I can make that statement, right? I hear it from other imams, you know, like I, I, this community, they don't care. I said, but how would a community care? What is caring? Right? So you say, you know what? They are not, um, uh, they, you know, people don't attend the lectures uh, the way I expect them. And, you know, when I, uh, when I uh, get sick, people don't call me. See? So that, that's actually not what he's talking about. This has nothing to do with respect. The community might be respecting this imam so much, right? But maybe they lack into the issue. Maybe he does not communicate well with them. Maybe he created a barrier that people are afraid to call, thinking it's his personal life. You see? So you're accusing the community without actually any foundation. So it's easy for me to say, you know, this community doesn't care about me and they are not respecting me. But when you look at it, you'll find that I am the one who created the barrier so they don't actually interfere in my business because they feel that I am pr a private guy. So this community actually is respecting me. <laughs> you, you see my, my idea here? So I think they are disrespecting me while they are actually what? Respecting me. They are respecting my privacy. Because I am the one who created that. Now if I'm a friendly person and I'm asking about everyone and I am involved, yeah, and now I have a right to say that. You know, you guys, I'm dealing with you this way. I'm expecting you to reciprocate. I'm expecting the same from you. And unfortunately, that was not the... Uh, the deal so please you know show some respect here you, you get the idea right so marriage is very important so now the book here is telling us few points about how a woman makes her uh, relationship with husband strong she choose a good husband come on this is now too late for anybody who's already married right <laughs> uh, but it's never too late to make a good husband out of your husband Right? It's never too late. So choosing is the, before you get married, choosing the husband based on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us uh, that, you know, when somebody comes to you with the iman and uh, good manners and faith, you should accept them at once. Also, we talked last time before Hajj about the story when a woman come to Rasulullah, come, came to Rasulullah sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, my father wanted me to marry his nephew. Remember that story? Wanted me to marry his nephew because the nephew does not have a status in the community. But my father and myself who have a status in the community. So he wanted to raise the status of his nephew by marrying me to him. Okay? So Rasulullah sallam said, Do you want that marriage? Because if you don't want that marriage, we will void it right now. Even if your father wants that, even if your cousin wants that, but you don't want that, then that's it. She said, no, 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 no. I will not refuse my father's, you know, decision. I will marry my cousin. No problem. I have no problem. But I just wanted everyone to know that we are the ones who make the decision who, is, who our husband should be. All right. So whenever uh, you make before marriage teach your daughters that well, before marriage you are the one in control okay we can recommend 
as a father or as a mother or friends, we can recommend people. But once the decision is made, it's your decision. Don't blame anyone but yourself. And that's, that's a, a problem I face all the time with counseling people. You know, my parents did this and this and this. There's two different things. Arranged marriages and forced marriages. Forced marriages means you don't have a choice. And that's haram. That's not right. That's just wrong. Okay? But arranged marriage is when people recommend for you. Your parents, your family, they, they bring someone in your path, in your way. They arrange a meeting. There are functions. That's called arranged so people here confused said arranged marriage means forced marriage, which is not right. Arranged marriage means people arrange things. Okay? But you as a woman have the right to say, no, I call this off. I don't want that marriage. Right? Now if somebody insists on that, they are forcing you. Then you have rights. Right? To cancel that. So this is very clear. I hope it's very clear. So the woman is the one who says, I want this man or not. I want this man or not. So make the right choice uh, accordingly. And again, the foundation has to be based on the deen of Allah. I told you the real story that the Sheikh shared here, Sheikh Salah shared here one time. And he mentioned that there was it's an actual true story in Houston that a family, uh, uh, you know, has a daughter for age of marriage. And then somebody proposed to her who is very good deen, you know, religion wise. Uh, manners, family, but no finances. Struggling financially. Just wanted to start their life. We'll have a one bedroom apartment. He's still, you know, working on things. He's he's getting there, right? But proposed, they refused. Why? Because he's 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 not ready for our daughter. You know, our daughter is raised in that environment and all that, and we want somebody to take good care of take good care of her financially. Well. That's fine. Then, a few weeks later, another person comes, fully loaded. And that's what many sisters talk about now. Oh, big house, car, this, this, this. I have a suitor. Who is da, 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 da. Oh, okay. Great. Does he pray? No. So, all what you said actually doesn't mean anything to me. Doesn't mean anything to me. Right? Because if you knew that he's good, why, why you lost him? Right? So this is, this is what happened. He's fully loaded. House, car, job, everything. No good manners. Right? Manners are not good. Religion is not good. But the family accepted him. And then when they were asked, why? They said, yeah, inshallah, Allah will help him repent and be good. But why you did not say about the first one, Allah will help him and will be rich? You see? So if you think Allah will help the second one to repent and be good, so you should have thought the same about Allah, you know. Allah is able, if, Allah, if, you, th if you believe Allah is able to do that, which He is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, able to correct him and fix him and all that, should have used the same logic with the first guy. But here the foundation of marriage is not Allah and His Rasul. That's what I said in the beginning, right? It is more of material, of the life, the life, right? And that's why I respect so much the sisters who make the decision based on the deen. You know, they have a line of people who are fully loaded and everything, but they say, no, it's not for me. I'm looking for something else. Then Allah give you barakah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you will see that happiness coming in your heart. Even you don't have the material happiness, but you will have the contentment that you are with Allah. Allah will not abandon you. Allah will give you a good child. Allah will give you a happy life. Allah will make you content. Allah will make you pray on time. Allah will make you read Quran, you know. Allah will make people love you. So this is, these are great favors of Allah beyond the material uh, life. You can get the material life and again, also, I counsel many youth in the age of marriage. And then I talk to some girls, for example. MashaAllah, the girl is, is good and pretty, good looking. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless her and all that. But... Then she have a big list about the to be husband, you know. I want the husband to be tall. I want him to be like a master degree. I want him to be like a, this much money. I want him this. I want him that. Right? Then I shoot the question. I said, well, what if I tell you that I have that person right now? Yeah? I have that person right now. What would you say? Said, okay, Sheikh, introduce me. But don't you think that he have a list as well? 
right? What, what tells you that you are the girl of his dreams? If someone with these characteristics, ask yourself, why would he be looking at someone like me? Right? So if you want someone with a master degree, what do you have? If you want somebody rich, what do you have to offer? Right? If you want someone who will love you and pamper you, what are you going to do in return? Why would he be doing that? What do you have that any other woman doesn't have? So you can get that list. You have to be that special. Same goes for the man. Right? Same goes for the man. I meet many brothers who come to the masjid. Why you are not married, Akhi? You are like 30 years old, 35 years old. Why are you? Oh, I have not met the girl. What, do you, what, what girl you are looking for? What girl are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for a girl who's tall, who is fair skin, who is this, who is that. And they give you, mashallah, big list. And I'm saying it openly and right? bluntly, right? Because that's how I get it, yeah. And I'm from a good family. And mashallah, she prays. She can be mother of my children. Wallahi, someone one time sent me like the thing as if he's looking for a CEO of a company or something like that, yeah. Like he wants someone, she has to be fun. He sent me two pages. Two pages, for God's sake. Two pages. You know, the brother said, two pages. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, she has to be politically involved. I don't care which, which party she is in, Democrat or Republican, but she has to be politically involved. Okay, even but economically, she is independent. She can manage the finances, da, 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 da. And she is ready to be a stay-home mom, but we can work out if she can find a job, mashallah. And then, you know, she has to be fun. Like, you know, whenever I say a joke, she's a... And I'm listening, reading, seriously, I'm, I'm actually reading this, right? Then, you know, I, 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 I had to give it to the brother, right? I had, I had to give it to him, you know. I told him, I think Allah have not created that one yet. You know, that, that's still, still not there, you know. That you have to wait, right? Well, we, we have to wait. We have to find two people, uh, perfect, get them married. Then, you know, put them in a lab to get you a girl who is raised just for your custom kind of thing. Come on, man. You know, like, really? You know, this, this is not how you do things. Well, life, if it is done like that, nobody will get married. If, it is, if this is the way it is done. Subhanallah, you have to open your heart. Open your heart and really try to find someone who will help you be a servant of Allah. That's what you need to look for. And believe me, she will come in front of you. He will come in front of you. You will find. But you have to go for Allah Azza wa Jal. Said, Ya Rabb, give me the good spouse that I'm looking for, right? Give me a good spouse who fears you, who can make me secure, who can make me a good woman, a good man, you know, like that. And then start looking with that open heart and you will find that they come in front of you. They will come in front of you and ask people and they will come in front of you. Subhanallah. But making that list, who tells you that the other person is looking for someone like you? If we find that successful girl, who's, why she would be looking at someone who, who might tell her to stay home? Why? Yeah? If we find someone with all this qualification, why she would be a stay-home mom? And my, you know, my question to you, you know, if she's that educated, she's that fun, she's that independent, she's politically involved, why she stay at home? Why? Just because you do? Why she would do that to you? What are you going to offer in return? Yeah, I'm going to offer her me being her husband. MashaAllah. You know, like, or the other one, me, just me accepting him as a husband, that's enough, you know? I am whoever I am. No, you are not whoever you are. You are a servant of Allah like any other woman. Trust me, sisters. Any woman, any woman, does not matter who she is. Take this as a rule, yani. Any woman, doesn't matter who she is. If she invites the attraction of men, she will find men coming after her. So does not, does, that does not make you special. What makes you special is the more you're covered. Is the more you are, you know, haya. Haya means like modesty. That's what makes you special. It's not how you are exposed. The more you are exposed, the lesser you are actually. Lesser, you know, because you will find some people looking for that. The more you expose the product, the more people will come at it. Am I right? Yeah, but jewelry is not in the street. They are not with street vendors. They don't sell jewelry, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, diamond and stuff like that with street vendors. Street vendors, they sell you cheap stuff, like $2, $1, stuff like that. But the, the, the more expensive the product, you find more, you know, 
more issues. You know, it needs to be in a store. It needs to have an alarm system. It needs a security. It needs this. It needs certain customers to the point that they will tell you, you cannot enter here with this dress. You have to be wearing a tie. <laughs> you have to talk like that. You cannot come yourself. You have to send your uh, agent. You know, there are process, the, the more expensive. So the woman is the same thing. Allah created you precious. Allah created you expensive. Allah created you with value. So if, 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 if the standard is how many men are running, running behind you, there's no good standard, actually. It's not a good standard. It's actually the lesser people are behind you, the better you are. <laughs> because now your circle is a choice, is exclusive. Not anyone can handle this. Not anyone, right? Only a pious, righteous person will go for that girl. Should be happy and proud. Don't you think so? But if there is a girl, everyone walking in the street is, wants to propose. What does that tell you anyways? What does that tell you? You know, like every, everyone wants to get married, they find like, okay, go there. But if you, if the family raised their daughter properly, there would be a filter. Not anybody who can dare to come and ask for the hand of that. Except certain people. Mm. Also, she is obedient to her husband and shows him respect. Obedience here does not mean submissive in a negative connotation. Obedient in the obedience of Allah. If I tell my wife, have you prayed Zuhr? She said, no. I said, please go ahead and, and pray Zuhr. No, but I have this. I said, no, leave whatever in your hand and pray Zuhr right now. That's an order. Yes? That's an order. She is obligated to obey. She is obligated to obey. It's not because I am telling her or I'm forcing her. Because I'm asking her or I'm ordering her to obey who? And that's it. That's how it should be looked at. So I am in the middle. It is not my order. It is Allah's order I am carrying. So you're obeying me because I'm asking you to obey Allah. Let's go to a party. Right? No, I don't want to go to that uh, party tonight. There are people there disobeying Allah and all that. No, you have to go. No, she does not have to obey me now. Because, you know, I'm exposing her to something un-Islamic. People are drinking there and all that. And all these women, you know, they, they, they backbite and all of this kind of... And I don't want to socialize with that. No, you have to go. You have to obey me. No, I don't have to obey you. You see that? You see here? So obedience here, when we say a wife should be obedient to her husband, please don't take it in that connotation that all this feminist crazy stuff comes, right? That obedience. Why the husband does not have to obey his wife either? You know, then, then they will go somewhere else. But we don't, we don't want to take the discussion there. You are obeying as long as you are obeying Allah. Anybody who's telling you something which is not about the deen, don't obey them. Whether your parents or your husband or your, whoever. Obedience in the obedience. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. There is no obedience for a created يعني, human being as long as they are disobeying Allah. We are not obligated to obey them. Okay? So obedience is obedience of Allah. Allah give your husband the responsibility to deliver these orders to you. Then you obey him because obeying Allah. It's not because of him. Okay? He's telling you to pray. He's telling you to wear hijab. He's telling you to be modest. He's telling you to be patient. He's telling you that you got to obey. Say yes. And you enjoy it. You enjoy that Allah give you a husband who is ordering you with ma'roof. Who is ordering you with the good things. The right things. He's not leaving you to the shaitan. You know? He's correcting you and all. That is why? Because you are an emotional being. And a man is a man with reason. So whenever they are order is not like to... Some men actually they do that. They bec it becomes um, more of a subjugating kind of like and that's bad, right? They are kind of like feel that this is my God-given right to put my woman down under my feet. That's haram. That's not right. That's, no. Actually, when you are ordering your wife to do things, you are bringing her up. <laughs> you are making her actually more res Islamically responsible. You know, later in life, you will not be needing to order her with anything. You know why? Because she will be ordering the kids. Pray, do this, do that. Why? Because you already guided her through. So you have a helper now. Okay? So if this is done right, subhanAllah, later, no need. We'll just look at each other and we'll know what we need from each other. It's not about ordering. It's not about ordering. 
An obedient wife will cause the husband to obey her indirectly. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the, you know the man, like when he finds his wife always agreeing with him in you know, a good things and halal as we agreed, right? In, not in haram, you know, obedient all the time. He will do his best to see what she wants and he will do it before even she asks. You know, he will find what's her likes and dislikes without even she expressing them. And this woman is like, everything I say she does. Subhanallah, you know? What do, that, what do I need to do for her now? <laughs> she's not asking much and she is, I'm asking so much and she's doing it. So I need to make her happy. Okay, but opposite brings the opposite. So she shows respect, especially in front of people and in front of his family. Pay attention to that. You might not dislike your in, you might you might not like your in-laws much. You might. That's that's okay. This is natural. But right is the right. Rights of people upon you is rights. Your husband have right upon you, and it makes him happy that you are nice to his in-laws. Even I'm going to say that bluntly. Even if you fake it, sisters. Just do it. It's better than just um, being uh, not nice because it stays in the heart. Same thing for the husband, you know. I, I, if I'm teaching this book, you know, the other way, I'll say to the husband the same thing. Your in laws, you might not like them much, but it will make your wife so happy that you are honoring her parents. So keep doing that. It goes both ways, right? Also, in front of your in laws, never complain about your husband. My advice to you, it's counterproductive. It does not make you better. They will not like you over their son. I'll repeat this again. Many sisters, they will fall in that trap. They find a listening mother-in-law, she will start complaining about her husband. That woman you're complaining to is the one who raised that son. Right? She will not accept anybody criticizing him, even if he has what you are talking about. Even if she's sure, she doesn't want to hear it from anyone. Are you with me? So she would be listening to you. Yeah, she loves you to death and everything. That's fine. But that's what you think. But she will never ever prefer you over her, husband, her, her son. Doesn't matter how bad he is. So it's counterproductive. Right? She'll despise you. So be careful. Don't complain about your husband to your in-laws. That's not, this is the last people you should complain. You know, when they ask you, say, Alhamdulillah, he's good. Unless there is something big, Right? And they are like on that level of fairness. Otherwise, find another entity like a sheikh or a counselor or someone that you can talk to. But your in-laws is a very slippery slope. Be careful. And it goes both ways again, right? If I keep complaining about my wife to my in-laws, again, they will not side with me all the time. They might advise her this and that, but they will not like it. So be careful how many times you do it and when you do it and how you do it. Okay, the best way is to talk openly. Talk openly to the husband. Talk openly, and that's respect. Because I respect you, because I love you. You hurt my feeling in one, two, three, four, and let him defend himself and let him talk. And it goes the other way around, right? And we accept. It's either you want a relationship or you want to be right. Remember that. If you are right all the time, it destroys the marriage. If you find yourself right all the time, even if you are right all the time. That husband will say, you know what, what good am I doing? If the husband is right all the time, then the wife will say, what good am I, am I anyways? I'm no good for nothing, right? So you destroy the relationship. So relationship has to be give and take. And give actually more than you take. Now, uh, also, <clears throat> she treats his mother and family with kindness and respect. We talked about that. She... Uh, endears herself to her husband and is keen to please him always you know like I'll tell you something cleanliness is half of faith cleanliness is half of faith and mashallah you know women by nature they are clean uh, creatures mashallah <laughs> clean 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 uh, humans but sometimes we get distressed sometimes we get distracted sometimes you have some issues going on but please, my sisters, don't let that interfere with your duties. Your hygiene, your cleanliness, your appearance, your home is important. If you cannot do, ask for help. 
but make sure you are presentable. Make sure your surroundings are screaming happiness. <laughs> you know, wherever you go, you find it's a clean place. You know, whenever you, wherever you go, whenever people look at you, it's like a flower in a garden of flowers, mashallah. So this is how it is. You know, this is, this is you. So don't take it as a duty, take it as more of you. Okay, so wherever I go, I want to make sure that this area is clean. This place is nice. Because I am here. You know, like when, whenever you go and you find people, you bring order to place. Some people like that. Sometimes we get intimidated by it, but actually it's a good thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I like it when uh, I have invitation at my house or we are invited at somebody's house and then everybody goes and wash the dishes after they finish eating. You know that that in itself might sound like a little tiny thing, but actually it's a huge thing. Because these people want order before they leave. They don't want to be, uh, uh, you know, the, the people who cause the mess and left with the mess. You see, you see my, how I, I look at it? Like you come to my house and all that. I'll be happy to clean after you leave. But you know, there is a kind of burden also inside. You know, I'm happy that you came, you ate, you fine, mashallah, you had fun, right? And you left happy. I'm happy for that. But now I'm alone with all this pile of dishes in my kitchen, me and my wife. It takes away from that happiness, right? It's me now and dealing with my reality, right? Now next time when I'm thinking, um, before I invite these people, I'm going to bring the disposable paper. And <laughs> yeah? You see? But you know, when you are not obligated to, I'm not telling you come do that at my house because I'm expecting that from you. It has to come with willingness. It has to come with love. It has to come with happiness. But I like it. I like it when I go somewhere. And I find my wife standing and my daughter standing in the kitchen with that host and making sure before we leave, everything is in order. That makes them happy also. You see? So I am happy that I came and they, uh, they honored me and they host uh, me in that beautiful way. But I left them happy that I'm a good host. I'm a good guest. I'm sorry. I'm a good guest. So for you being a good host, this is the least I can do. So not only you bring a gift with you, no, bring a gift when you're leaving as well. That's a gift when you're leaving. You know, these people, subhanAllah, I love them to come all the time to my house. Tiny things. Tiny things. That's why Rasulullah said, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ مَعْفِرَةٌ You know, good words, they, they go long way. Good words go long way. It's the thought that matters. Good words go long and long way. You know, subhanAllah. When you find in the community or society sisters who need help, go help them. Don't wait until they ask for help. Asking for help means it's late. When somebody come and ask us, I need help, that means it's late. We did not do our duty for looking. In looking. Find someone, someone sick, someone give birth, someone got married, someone uh, the flood issue. Some Try to and take initiative. You know, they need help with cleaning, they need help with cooking, they need help with groceries, do it. Right? You, you, this, is, this is what goes a long way. You know, Rasulullah wasallam was asked, there is that woman who is praying and fasting and doing dhikr and reading Quran, but she is bad to her neighbors. Rasulullah said she's in hellfire. And there is that woman who is not that practicing, but she's very good with everyone. Rasulullah said she's in Jannah. What does that tell you? The pillars. Remember? Pillars? When you focus on pillars only, it does not guarantee you Jannah. But those pillars have to change your manners, have to change your character. Remember that, sisters. This is very, very uh, important. So she endears herself to her husband. How she endears herself to her husband? By behavior. How I make myself liked by others? By how I deal with others. You don't impose on people to love you or like you. You just become likable. You just do the right things and people will like you automatically. Want you around. <laughs> As I said, you know, you go out of your way, was doing things, people want you around. But if you are a demanding person, people don't want to stick around you. So this is, this is very important uh, to know. So the wife is always uh, making her husband wanting her, making her husband want is to spend time with her, looking forward to the time that he goes to her. That is a good Muslim uh, wife, subhanAllah. Um, 
said Aisha radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, when he came back uh, to his wives after he had kept away from them for a month. You know when they angered him sometime, Rasulullah stayed for a month away from his wives, did not talk to them, did not enter their house and everything like that. So when he broke the, the, that separation, he went to the house of Aisha radiallahu anha first. So um, he said, I will not go into them for a month because he was angry with them. When 29 days has passed, he came to Aisha first. So he said, I'm not going to talk to you for a month, to all his wives, right? So after 29 days only, he went to Aisha. Uh, Aisha said to him, you swore to stay away from us for a month and only 29 days have passed. <laughs> You know, women are women, right? So she said, you know, you made an oath. Why are you coming today? You know, it's 29th. One more day to go. She wants to appear strong, you know, like all those women do that. You know, it doesn't matter how much she needs her husband. She will say, yeah, yeah one more day. will not hurt. It's okay. <laughs> so she's telling him that. And she said, you know, she added, she, she's a, one of the smartest women in the history of human is Aisha radiallahu anha. You know, after that statement, she added another statement to balance it. What do you think she would have said? See, she said what she said now, right? Like, you know, it's 29 days, why you came today? And she said, I have been counting them. Now you see the statement? So she balanced it. That means I care. I really want you to be back. See the balance of, of things? She gets her dignity, but at the same time, she loves her husband, she wants him back. You see, I've been counting them. Amazing. Uh, I've been counting uh, them. The Prophet wasallam said, this month is only 29 days. <laughs> uh, that particular month had only 29 days. So Aisha telling the Prophet that she had counted 29 days was a clear indication of her love towards her husband and of how she waited and missed him day after day, right? By day, hour by hour for him to come back to her. It shows how she loved and missed her husband. The approach made her even dearer to him, sallallahu alayhi wa You see the approach? You know, I am also independent and all that, but I cannot live without you. You see the balance? So this is how a wife endears herself to her husband. Yeah, you can demand rights and everything, but always make sure that you do these kind of little tiny things. It goes long way and it does not go unnoticed. She does not disclose his secrets. When we are mad or emotional, sometimes we do things that we are not happy with. But as I said, this is the importance of establishing limits. Wallah, it is important of establishing limits, especially at time of anger. anger. People call me and say, I divorced my wife, but I was angry. I said, of course, you are not going to divorce your wife while you're joking and watching a movie. You're going to look at her and divorce her, you know, like ha 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 laughing. You have to be angry. But you have to have a limit of anger, right? So when we are angry, we're not going to talk about divorce. So now at least both of us know that we're not talking about that. So whatever, however high we go, I know that this is not an option. So, you know, we have a, a room here to talk. But if I know that my life is threatened all the time, then I'm not, I'm not secure here. I know that my husband or my wife will flip on me anytime and run away from me anytime and disclose my secrets anytime. I'm not comfortable. How much do I share with you? If once you get angry, all my secrets are out. You see? So I don't know. You know, one time there was a in the old times, yeah, in the history, that uh, someone who had problems with his wife. And his friends have been telling him, what are the problems? He said, I cannot disclose my wife's secrets. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know? If I need your help, I'll ask for your help. But this is just something that cannot go to a third party. We decided that we split. Well, they split. Divorce happened. He said, now tell us what are the problems, you know. He said, I did not expose her secrets when she was my wife. Now she's a stranger person. I cannot backbite or expose her secrets either. You see, that is respect. 
That is respect. Unless she is doing something wrong and it's going to affect another man that she's going to get married, then that's another story, right? You have to warn the people if there's a grave issue, problem with that person, man or woman, you know, and they are going to repeat it with another human being, then you should stop that because you don't want that to be repeated with another family. A man who has a major issue with women, abuse for example, and then you know you say no I'm not gonna expose the secret and you know that he's gonna abuse another woman no you're gonna stop that you tell that woman by the way this guy is an abuser you know and he was doing this and this make sure if you want him he's not that anymore make sure of that okay but your duty to warn actually only the needed information don't volunteer with any extra information that person drinks that person cheats that person does that don't go over other things it's, it's not a wholesale, you know, like, okay, it's uh, open season. It doesn't work like that. So the wife does not expose her husband's secrets. And I'm warning sisters, whenever you have social gatherings, don't talk about your husbands in, the, in their absence and, 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 and do their secrets. Said Aisha, عنها, she was telling Rasulullah how jahiliya is. Jahiliya, like before Islam, 11 women sat and each one talking about her husband. Right? And Rasulullah listened to the whole thing. And the ulama told us, it does not mean he approves of the backbiting. Because this was the context of Jahiliyyah anyways. You know, Sayyidah so Aisha was quoting something from Jahiliyyah, like before Islam, what happened? She's not saying that this is okay to happen now. So women should not sit and share the secrets of their husbands. That's why Rasulullah did not comment except on a good one in the, in the hadith. She said the last couple he divorced his wife on a good note, but she married someone else and he did more financially to her than her husband, whom she loved, ex-husband, whom she loved so dearly. And at the end, she's saying, all what my new husband gave me is not even equal to the least of the utensils of my ex. You know, because this is the dunya, but the first one was love, right? So Rasulullah said, I will be to you like that man, but I will never divorce you. <laughs> you see? So he commented on that one. But he ignored all the other comments that were negative. That telling us that women should not talk negative about their husbands in the presence of others. Unless you are complaining to a judge or to a counselor or to a sheikh to fix the problem. Don't say, I just wanted to get it off my chest. Don't do that. Getting it off your chest, now it is in somebody else's mind. And it's not their load. It's not their personal responsibility. They're going to do whatever they please with it. They're going to share it with people. They're going to add, they spice it up. They create problems for you. So it's better to stay a load with you than to share it with those who are irresponsible. And once more than two people know something, that the whole community knows it. Trust me. Once it comes out. So she never shares her husband's secrets with anybody. And lots of times when people come talk to me in the office, they start talking about personal things, very personal, intimate things. So why are you doing that? This is not needed in our discussion, right? Oh, he does this, and his bathroom manners like this, and he changes his clothes like, wait, 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 wait. You know, like, stop. <laughs> stop this is these things are not to be shared like this it's, it's not like helpful here when you are mad at someone you kind of like make them naked in front of everybody else that's that's not right that's not good okay that, this this is it's not right it's for your own sake it's not good for you as a human being to 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 bring someone down like that and expose them you know imagine if someone helpless and you just keep exposing them in front of everybody else it will not make you rest and it will not make you good. She stands by him and offers her advice. And of course, the other side, the man has to allow his wife to stand beside him and give him advice. And there is nothing wrong with that. So Rasul Sallallahu got advice from his wives. Advice actually that saved the whole Ummah. Umm Salama saved one time. Aisha saved one time. Umm Salama and the Umrah of Hudaybiyah. You know, when the Sahaba did not follow the order of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi by shaving and all that she said just do in front of them and they will follow and they followed the advice and they did so she saved the, the nasiha advice a woman can save her husband and Aisha did the same thing in Hajj time 
والرسول الله said split حج make it عمرة تمتع and they refused she said you know nicely tell them and order people around you to do it and he did and they followed you see that's a good advice and uh, always sisters whenever you give your husband advice give it to him out of love don't make him feel down that you know I am always right or I'm giving you this advice because I know better don't don't do that a man is a man you know by by nature he's a macho guy you know like he wants to be that caretaker protector of you he's like physically strong and all of that and if you keep taking that away from him it means he's not a man anymore it's not gonna make him love you it's actually will do the opposite and again I tell the brothers the woman wants to be admired wants to be loved wants to be chased wants to be like that so make sure you do this don't treat her like your friend or your buddy you know <laughs> she's not so what I'm telling you now I'm telling men and myself other things you know so deal with your husband as the man he is make him feel that you need him don't put him down don't make him feel like he's good for nothing right every effort should be appreciated etc so this is very important then you listen to your advice he will never be shy to tell you you're right you know give me direction next time when we drive <laughs> so this is this is good and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam showed us the best of manners of listening to his wives and giving them advice and taking advice from them as well she is cheerful and grateful when she meets him <laughs> open the door Ah, oh, at last you came, man. You know, been suffering, struggling all day long. Where have you been? Very bad. No good. I know you were going through lots of hard time, but he was too. Right? So you need each other. I also tell the man when you come in, don't come and say, Oof, what a bad day I have today. Don't do that. Both are wrong, you know. But I'm talking about women now, so please understand that there is also other advice on the other side. But we're talking about you now. So, once the door open or I'm coming or something like that, try to rush and do something special, something nice, you know, like rush to your husband, you know, or, you know, make some good, nice air fresheners, spray candles, you do your thing, you know, like, like whatever makes the atmosphere happy and welcoming. Even you are stressed. I know. Even if you are stressed, this will help you. Just watch. Watch it happening. Watch the magic happen. Okay? A man demand is very little, by the way, and very easy to please. Women, they take time. <laughs> Until you are pleased, it takes time. So for you to take your time, give us that little tiny thing in the beginning, right? Don't be miserly. You know? Be generous. I'm serious. So once the man comes, mm, beautiful house, beautiful, mashallah, you look pretty, you look great. Oh, I'm hungry. Okay, eat food and everything. Now you can give the list of your things. I'm serious. All ears, right? All ears. But once comes and says, I've been struggling in your children, that and about, blah, blah, blah. Allahu Akbar. I wish I did not come, you know. I wish I stayed longer in the work. And actually some people will do that. Will start doing that. You know what? Oh, I cooked. Uh, I'll do dinner, you know. I'm, I'm late at work today. With no excuse. Just want, don't want to come to the storm, you know. Ah, so I'm just warning you as my sisters. And I'll tell my sisters, my actual sisters, the same thing. Yeah, you're stressed and everything. But Allah give you a man. And the man, Allah, is like a child. Don't think a man is like, oh, that big guy. But he's like a child inside, you know. He wants to be taken care of from his wife. Especially if he's working in an atmosphere, there are women around. And you know what I'm talking about. There are women without heart out there. There are women who will just do anything to destroy anybody, right? So be careful and be that pious, righteous Muslim who, whose husband is looking forward to come back to her for safety. You are his protection, right? You are in his mind whenever he's surrounded by this fitna. You know, I know I know someone special, you know, get, going to relieve me from that stress. 
So be that woman. And grateful. Grateful. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, you are doing a great job. May Allah reward you. How can I help? You know, make dua for him. In front of him too. In front of him. You know, one sheikh one time, he says, it doesn't take much. Like if your husband is leaving and you go put his coat on or, you know, like bring his shoes or like give him like his keys or something like that. I said, may Allah protect you. Go in the protection of Allah. You know, I pray to Allah to bring you safe to us. You know, these few words keep going in his head forever when he's driving and all that. MashaAllah, you know, I don't want to leave the house. <laughs> you know, I can't wait until I come back. And when he's coming back, he gives a call. I'm, I'm going to be home in 10 minutes and 15 minutes. And then when he comes home, he comes, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, that Allah returned you back safe. Everything is fine, Alhamdulillah. I mean, when he asks you, how is your day going? And a man should ask, how is your day going? How is it good? And uh, Alhamdulillah, everything is fine and all that. And bring it slowly, as I said, right? Bring it slowly. Then a man is a troubleshooter by, by, by nature. He will find the solutions, right? And when you want to talk, choose the right time. After he's comfortable, he's happy, all of that. And then choose the right time, he will be listening to you. You might even agree on a time of the week that just for talking. Yeah. But be grateful. You know, grateful is a key. Dealing with men. Dealing with men, we like people to be grateful. Even for the least of things, be grateful, you know, be thankful. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, La yashkurillah, man la yashkurin nas. He who is not thanking people is not thankful to Allah. Because Allah is the one who put that husband to give you what he's giving you. So you should be thankful to that person, to be thankful to Allah. Yeah, exactly. Like, like women like to be loved all the time. Like you want to hear, I love you all the time. Men like to be appreciated all the time. Yeah, I'm just giving you the secrets. Yeah, You like to be appreciated. You can say it directly, indirectly, show it with actions. Caring, right? Like, you know, caring. Like, if a man is going to take a shower, for example, and you prepare the towel and the things and all of that, it goes a long way. He might actually show you that he will do it himself. But believe me, every single man is screaming from inside, I want somebody to take care of me. Okay? So I'm just giving you like an, an, um, uh, a little example. Right? A little example. Uh, I, I tell men the same thing, by the way. I tell the men the same thing. Sometimes you need to steam or iron your wife's hijab or clothes or something like that. I, I do. I actually do say that. So when I'm telling you, I'm not like only focusing on you. And I'm seeing the other things. The other. So we, we, we should do those, these things. So sometimes uh, uh, um, a man wants to, and this is a cultural issue here. Another example, for example. I, I'll give you another example. In my culture, Egyptian culture, for example, if I come from work and my wife tells me, do you want to eat? I'll say no. Because that question is improper. I'm just telling you, this is an improper question. In American culture, it's all right. It's very straightforward. It's either you want to eat or you don't want to eat, right? Do you want some food? I'm making some food. Do you want some food? Egyptian, I'll say, no. You should not actually ask me. You know, where, where else do I eat? You know, from a logical point of view, right? I went to work in the morning, right? And I'm coming straight from work. You know that I come just to you right now. And you did not make a lunch box for me. So what is the point of asking me, like, I'm making some food, do you want to eat? <laughs> no, I don't want to eat. I don't want anything from you. Basically, that's the reply. I'm just telling you how... The, and then it creates a gap, right? Just make good food. Either I eat it or I don't eat it. If I don't eat it, I'll eat it later. If I eat it, alhamdulillah. But don't be so American with me. <laughs> you know, so this is, this is the whole idea. You are cutting fruit for yourself at the, the kitchen. Right? Don't ask you, I am making some fruit. Do you want some fruit? Don't do that. I'm, I'm telling you about my culture, right? Just bring the fruit and let's all eat. Don't be the individualistic culture it is. I teach my kids the same thing. When you wake up in the morning, kids wake up in the morning to go to school. Who's going to prepare breakfast today? Me, Baba, for everybody. You should. Not only for yourself. The easiest thing is to go and get what you like. Yeah? From the fridge. Oh, I like this and don't care about your siblings. No, I want 
you to do for everybody. And don't ask them. If they want to eat breakfast, alhamdulillah. They don't want to eat breakfast, fine. You just put it and put it in the fridge, you know. Someone will eat it. I'm just telling you from a cultural perspective, you know, like how it works. So be a cultural, culture sensitive to reach to others, right? So it goes both ways. If uh, my wife is like that, I understand where she's coming from, but she also should need to understand where I'm coming from, so we're both not strangers for each other. Okay? So when you ask, so in some cultures, when you ask somebody if you're hungry, even if they are hungry, they will not eat. They want to be offered the food. If I come to your home, visiting you, right? In Zohar time, you need to prepare lunch. I'm just telling you my culture, right? Don't b bring me biscuits and tea. I'm not going to ask you. I'm just telling you how you think. Right? So if you now, it is, uh, it is uh, one o'clock. If you come to my house right now, I'm not going to make tea for you. I'll cook something. Whether you eat it or not, that's up to you. Right? Oh, I ate. Alhamdulillah, it's simple. Just, if you like it, fine. You know, I just cook some food, I'll put it. Even if you eat a little bit, make me happy. If you don't eat at all, I just cooked, right? I'll give you to take with you home. But that makes me fine, makes me happy. All right? I'm not going to ask you, are you hungry? Maybe your culture says, yeah, I am hungry. I want to eat. But in my culture, it's kind of like, uh, no. <laughs> you know, it puts me down. It makes me like, you know, I'm, ah, no. Right? Even if I'm hungry, my stomach is like, I want to eat so bad. And I can smell the spice in your kitchen. Oh, you know, <laughs> please cook something for me. Please cook something for me. I'm saying in my head. And you are offering me tea and crackers. Come on now. All right. So I hope you got the idea, right? So that's why it will go to the default of be, you being generous. Just be generous. Don't ask people, can I be generous with you? Don't do that. Just be generous with them. Solve the problem. So how you become generous? You ha I'm sure you have a definition of being generous at your home. You, ha you do, right? So when somebody comes to your home or when your husband is there, be generous with your husband. And that's it. Don't ask him, can I be generous with you? <laughs> Don't do that, right? Just be generous, right? So whenever, and believe me, sisters, wallah, I swear to Allah, every man I met in different cultures, this food issue is the same thing. Is the same thing. They love their wives to feed them. They do adore it, even if he's a chef in the kitchen. You know, I'm just telling you, like you bringing something and eating with, sharing it together, putting it in a nice way, they will love it. It doesn't matter. Any culture, anything. So, but don't ask that question. Maybe this is me, but I just don't ask. Do you want to eat? Don't do that. Just feed him. <laughs> uh, she shares his joys and sorrows. When the husband is unhappy, show seriousness. Also, concern, right? We call it concern. He has to do the same, but now we're talking about you, so concern. And if he's happy, oh, what makes you happy? You know, like, you know, share the good news and all of that. Even sometimes it might sound silly in your eyes or not interesting, you know, something in your eyes. But you're happy because he's happy. It's not what makes you happy. You know, sometimes it's like, uh, you know, today something happened at work, you know, this and that, and he's excited and all of that. And then I said, and what is the point? You see? And I don't get it. What's the point? See, that kind of attitude, it depresses. And it goes the same for other. If a woman is excited and a man do the same thing, right? So sometimes you show like, huh, really? Wow. MashaAllah, you know? Like, but like, how does this thing work? You know, I'm trying to understand, you know, like try to share there. You know, be, be in, the, in the mood there. Then you will, the person in front of you will feel that you care. You really actually care about the jokes, about the things that makes him happy and the things that makes him sad. You care. And you're trying your best to be part of it. Then it will do the same to you. We'll sit and listen for hours. I know you like that, sisters. I know. Sisters like the man just sit and listen sometimes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just sit and listen as well. Uh, so it's very important to be concerned 
and attention. So sometimes there are uh, emotional uh, reflexes that we don't control, but I want you to be aware of them. I'll give you an example. A husband is fixing something in the house. All right? Like, let's say fixing the garage or fixing something in the house. And the wife is sitting and watching. And they're having a conversation, you know. And she's telling him, don't do it. Just hire a plumber. Don't, you know, like this kind of conversation, right? But he insists on doing it. Okay? Then he did something wrong. Then she laughs. Right? That's very bad. Okay? She laughs. Ah, I told you. You should have hired somebody. That actually makes it worse beyond imagination. I'm just telling you right now. Okay? But you are doing it innocently. You're not doing it out of uh, gloating or grudge or hatred. You are doing it as an innocent being. I'm just telling you, like, you know, I'm giving you the benefit of doubt. Yeah? And the sisters will yeah, just do that. Or maybe when he is like hitting the nail, he hit his finger. Ah! And she says, okay, all right, I'm going to bring you some band aid. I told you not to do it. Don't laugh when somebody else is suffering. Even we teach the kids. One of the kids slip and fall in a puddle. They everybody start laughing. You know that scene? Start laughing. It goes with us when we become adults as well. Okay? So somebody is struggling or suffering or something and everybody is laughing at them. The phone goes down and broke, shatters into pieces. Ah, you broke it! Ah, like that. That's not good human behavior. You know, you should share with people their misery, share with people their sorrow, share with people their moments of sadness. Even if they make a mistake, even if you warned them and they went heads on to do the wrong, don't come and laugh at them and say, I told you so, I told you so. Especially if it is your husband. So always share that moment serious, you know, it's a serious matter. So when you look at their face, at his face, if he's sad, don't be sad, but don't be happy. All right? So just, just show some concern there. Um, she does not look at other men. Women does not look at other men. Because I tell you right now, every man will look at other women and see what his wife is missing, what is missing in his wife. First thing. Any man looks at any other woman will spot the first thing, the spot what his wife is missing. Same thing. If the woman starts looking at other men, she will spot what is missing with her husband. Shaitan does that. Magnify it, you know. He hides all the defects in other people and show you the missing part. And he hides all the good things in your spouse and show you the defects. That's the default. He said that to Allah, actually. He said, I am going to deviate them and I'm going to try my best to come from all around. For all ways. So the woman does not look at other men or talk to other women with a level of comfort because she will find what is missing in her husband. For sure. Especially if she finds an ear. Uh, so, basically, uh, any, you know, if, if I'm a counselor here, I'm a counselor. And a woman comes to complain about her husband. I have to be very, very professional. Because if I give her the comfort that only a husband gives, that's dangerous. You see, my, uh, that's why professional is very important. That's why when somebody comes, say, I'm not a professional counselor. I'm not. Because this is dangerous for me. But I'm a religious counselor, right? So you come, I'll tell you, Allah said, Rasulullah said. Not beyond that. That's why I don't want you to share with me the secrets of your life or... Counselors are trained for that. But you see my idea, right? Because she, she's a woman. She is missing something in her husband. I am a man. I am having also spouse. So now, if she complains about what she's missing, and I try to comfort her without having the proper training, this becomes a problem. And that's what happens actually around. Same thing, any woman. Social media, this and that. A man comes in. Oh, why you are sad? Oh, you deserve better, or this and that, and then she runs behind. Well, that man is only talking to you in that sense. He has his own set of issues too. Maybe he is actually having a wife, he's not giving her the attention that he's giving to you. Why do you think he cares about you? 
You see the idea here? So that's how shaitan works with things. A yeah, woman, uh, oh, she's giving me what my wife is not giving me. She laughs and she smiles. She uh, brings me coffee when I go to work. And she's the perfect woman. I wish my wife is like that. But that woman, she has a husband. She's not doing what she's doing to me. You see, you see the irony of things here? You know, like she's married or she's not married. But if she's married, she would not do that to her husband. She's doing it because I'm a co-worker that she likes. So this, this actually is not the woman I should be looking at. You, you get my point here. So if a man is comforting you in the passing, don't take this comfort as something serious. Right? Because if you are his wife, he would not be doing that. Maybe he actually has a wife, he's not doing that. Okay? So just be extra careful when you are dealing with other uh, men. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no woman and a man staying in one place except shaitan is the third. It's very important. And if only one of you sitting here, I would not be teaching the class, even though we are in a masjid. يعني. But if two or more, that's fine. Right? Because, you know, shaitan stays away because now there are two different entities. Each one is like a supervisor on the other. You see? But if it's one man and woman, even for ta'aleem of the Quran, teaching of Quran should not be allowed. No man and woman can sit privately together. And in, and in the virtual world, or the, it's, it's the same thing, same exact thing. Actually, it's more sensitive. Because when people are far away from each other, they have some more comfort. They, are, they dare to say things and do things that they will not do if they are maybe close. It is not going to happen that fast. But people, oh, friend, click, like, become friends, buddies, you know? Share pictures and everything two, three days later. You would not do that if it's face to face, you know, it's not like that. But that also gives a level of danger. She, um, she does not describe other women to her husband. That's very important. Like the woman does not like her husband to describe women to her or talk about a woman that they are pretty or this in front of her. She should not do the same. She shouldn't do the same. Right? Oh, there was a woman in that party. Oh, she's dancing. Perfect dancing and the, who's that oh she's such and such and such oh that's haram don't do that don't share about other women in front of your husband be extra careful sisters even if it's your friend even if it's your sister even if it's your family don't it's a no-no i hope i'm clear in this one and this is protection to your husband this is protecting yourself and protecting your husband you are his woman and that's it don't bring other women in this relationship. Don't describe other women to him and don't talk about how pretty other women and this and that. And be secure about yourself as well. Right? <clears throat> it's very, very important to don't describe other women in front of that. And a man also does not describe other men in front of his uh, wife. Comparison is not good in that sense. Oh, look at that woman, how, how she is to her husband. Or look at that man, how he cares about his wife. You're putting each other down, doesn't help. Doesn't help. Because you don't know what they are, have in their life. You don't have, know how they have them. Maybe they're showing off in front of people. Maybe this is their assurance that we are still okay. But they have trouble at home. She tries to create an atmosphere of peace and tranquility for him. But we'll, we talked about that as well. And the verse saying this, Taskunu ilayha, dwelling, right? comfort house the house is your kingdom sisters one older lady one time she told me son look at the house and you will know what kind of woman lives in it you know an older lady I mean one time like my, like my grandmother's age she was saying that show me a house I'll show you what kind of woman right the house, the way the house is, cluttered, clean, this and that, you will know what kind of woman is. Her mind, herself, will reflect in her house. And I'm not here putting anybody in the spot or anything like that. We all have stress, right? But there are people who cannot live with no discipline. They, they, they have to have it somehow, right? They have to have it. They will delegate, they will create, they will find help, they will just do it. Men and women are both. There are men who are messy by nature. 
right by nature but to find a woman missy by nature that's kind of <laughs> like tricky and it's, it's there has to be something stressing her in her life there has to be something big going on right because woman is a caring human being caring you care about children their cleanliness uh, caring you know that that service is offered is natural to you as a woman but men are messy by nature right so when you find a man organized and disciplined oh, this is good right when you find a woman undisciplined there is something something not right in this equation she's tolerant and forgiving of course um, the the woman subhanallah with all the patience that Allah give her that's expected and look child wakes up every couple of hours when a newborn when the child is sick when she is like cooking and cleaning and maybe working outside and doing all of this thing that's that's patience this is an amazing human being right there right so sometimes tolerance is something that you need to work to be keeping that as as a characteristic of yours tolerance Allah reward you a long way that's why the test of the women is always intolerance and patience the test of men is always injustice and fairness. You know, we snap easy, we get angry, we shout and all of that. But our test is to be just. Even when we get angry, don't transgress people. But woman is patience. Because patience is your nature. When you lose it, it's kind of like a, hmm, that's not expected from you. So the, a man is supposed to be helpful to others physically. So if there's someone need physical help and there's a man standing there, mm, there's something wrong about this guy, right? Because this is something expected from you and you're not doing, everybody will look at it, okay? But if somebody weak, sick, sitting in a wheelchair and somebody needs help, you are not going to blame, blame the guy who is weak or, weak or sick or sitting in a wheelchair because that's not expected from him. He's actually expect someone to help him. But if someone is strong and standing and watching somebody getting beaten, you are going to blame this guy. So a woman is supposed to be tolerant and patient and all that. That's why when she loses it, everybody like points, why, why? Right? So that's why the test of the woman is in patience and tolerance. She's strong uh, in character and she's wise. She's strong in character and she's wise. SubhanAllah. Wisdom is very important. Um, she's strong when she's in her parents' house. Father's taking care of her, mashallah, you know, she's talking and all that. She should stay strong also when she goes to her husband. There is difference between strong and arrogance. Strength and arrogance, right? Strong doesn't mean that uh, you're not loving, you're not tolerant. No, actually, that's strength too. You know, sometimes they say strength and weakness. You know, like somebody like being weak, they control everybody around them. <laughs> You know, being like, you know, I can't do this. So everybody's actually around them. They become strong because everybody's helping them because of their weakness. So that weakness is a strength in itself because it brings all the help around. So sometimes the women, they uh, overlook that aspect, that aspect of, if, of being a female, of being like, you know, weak and that. That's not, it does not mean that you're down. Actually, you mean you're in control of situation. Because you know the man needs somebody to take care of. They want somebody like to be like that, right? So they can take care of. They can like, you know, have control over the situation. So you are strong, and that's wisdom too. That's actually wisdom too. Um, <coughs> the primary motive of these women in taking up such a strong stance uh, in in in. Uh, in Islam, yani. uh, the Sheikh here is referring to Umm uh, Sulaim. Her son is Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu. Uh, her husband Malik ibn Nadr uh, was not a Muslim, um, and she insisted that he has to come to Islam. And Umm Habiba bin Abi Sufyan remained steadfast in her Islam when her husband uh, abstained from Islam and left. She stayed in in, the, in 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 Islam. She stayed in in there. That's why that's that's strength and character. You know, she's strong in character. She did not compromise. She loves her husband and everything, but if he disobeys Allah, no, right, and stays strong. 
and she's wise you see the story of Aisha radiallahu anha 29 days but I waited and all that so this is wisdom right another one like Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling her I know when you are angry at me and when you are happy with me I know she said how he said that when you are happy with me when you make an oath you say uh, no by the Lord of Muhammad you make the the oath he said la wa rabbi Muhammad no by Allah the Lord of Muhammad right but when you, you are angry with me, you said, La wa Rabbi Ibrahim. <laughs> no, by the Lord of Ibrahim. It's the same Lord, right? It's the same Allah. But she does not want to say his name, right? So he said, telling her, I know. When you are angry at me, when you make oath, you mention Prophet Ibrahim. And you said, Allah, the Lord of Ibrahim. But when you are happy with me, you said, Allah, the Lord of Muhammad. She said, Now, how she replies, Wisdom. See the wisdom? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I only abandon the name. Abandon the name, the, the pronunciation of the name. That means you are in the heart, right? Say, so I'm angry, but only your name, you know, changes from my lips. That's it. But you are somewhere else, right? So that's wisdom. So even if I'm angry at you, I'm not abandoning you. You see the wisdom here? So she's strong in personality and character. And he recognized that. He told her, you get angry at me too. I know that. So that's, that's strength in character, right? To be angry with Rasulullah sallallahu subhanallah. <laughs> you know, perfect man, and she's still angry with him. But when he showed her, she said, I'm just angry with the name, you know, but never with you. You're in my heart and all that. So this is wisdom when handling the man. Wisdom. Don't, you know, like you can say things, but pull him to you. Like don't push, like don't corner uh, with no solutions. This, 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 and the only way like that. It has to be like, like, only like that. Then you know, that's, that's going to push away more, not close to you. So always try to find solutions um, to be wise uh, and all of that. She's one of the most successful uh, wives. Be self-motivated. Motivation, and I'll finish with that, inshallah. Motivation is external and internal. What is motivation? Is the thing or the person uh, that pushes you to do things extra. That's motivation. Motivation, something motivates you or someone motivates you. Okay, like, for example, I'm staying home to do the breakfast or the lunch or the dinner but if a certain person comes I'm gonna do extra that's motivation right motivates me well I'm sitting there and all that but then somebody said let's go exercise that's motivation right there all I found some time or somebody did something or that's called external motivation external motivation is the thing that all of us looking for but internal motivation is very very hard Internal means it comes from within you. How you get it? You have to believe in yourself. You have to get over your insecurities. And this is very important to finish the lecture with, right? You have to get over insecurities. I have my own insecurities. I'm, I'm, I'm going to confess to you. I'm going to share. Do you, do you know that I have stage fright? Can you imagine that? I have stage fright. I have stage phobia. I do. Me, Mamdur, I have stage fright. I get scared to death when I stand in front of people and talk. If I did not tell you that, would you believe it? Exactly. Every time in the fundraiser, I'm scared to death and my stomach growls that I'm going to fail. Every single time never changes for the past 20 30 years is the same exact thing but i had to get over it you know i cannot let that phobia or that insecurity stop me from fundraising because this is for the community now you see i benefit yes but the bigger it's community i cannot make you feel that i'm just sharing with you something intimate to me something important to me why because i will tell you all of us have our own insecurities i have a stage fright i don't like to be speaking in front of public especially if the number is big but i will speak in public when the number is big 
I will show confidence and I will go like somebody who does not know how to swim and jumps from a helicopter in the ocean. I will jump if this is the only way to save someone, do it. But it doesn't mean I'm not scared. I am scared. I have my own insecurities, but I have to come over them to have the self-motivation. That's what I wanted to close with. So sisters, everyone have their own securities. You might be insecure about the way you look, the way you talk, the way you behave. Whatever it is, your education, you have insecurity. Make it a strength. Make it a reason for you to self-motivate you to do the opposite. And you will succeed. You will find people encouraging you. That's why, you know, once I start and I, I forget, you know, just, that's it. But before I get to the stage, I'm shaking. Every khutbah of Jum'ah. Can you imagine every single khutbah of Jum'ah? That the hardest moment in my life is walking from my car to the member over here. It's heavy, heavy, heavy on me. You cannot even imagine. I'm just telling you, like, but I have to do it. That's what I'm saying. I just do it. You have to just do it. You have to face your fears. You got to face them heads on. Nobody's going to help you but you. I know. If I, if I listen to it, it's not going to work. That's why you become a successful person. Wallahi, I'm scared. Every single time I stand on the member for khutbah al-Jum'ah, for even the five minutes after salah, sometimes my heart is shaking. I don't, I'm not prepared. I don't know what I'm going to say. And people are having expect high, very high expectations. Sometimes I'm not prepared. I don't want and I'm hiding there. And everybody says, Sheikh Mamdou, are you going to tell us a few words? As, like as if I'm a radio or something like, you know, press the button and this sheikh is very knowledgeable. He's going to give us the lecture. And I stand here until the moment I stand here. Wallah, I don't have anything in my, in my head to speak about. And then I buy time. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. And I keep buying time and translating it until something comes in my head. But in, that, in those few seconds, it's like a year for me. But you have to get over it. I'm just sharing this with you to motivate you, right? So you have to do it. You got to do it. I am afraid of heights. I'm a person who's very afraid of heights, especially if it is not fenced. I'm afraid of heights. But one time I had to do a test to be accepted in, um, you know, um, academy or something like that. In, 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 when I was young, yeah, military academy. And they, I have to jump from like, you know, 25 feet or something like that in the water. I had to do it. And then, you know, if I don't do it, just the whole thing collapses. I just go home, right? But I had to do it. So walking there and going climbing up and doing this is like the worst thing ever. But I had to do it. And I did it. Yeah, I did not make it to that, but I did it. In my head, I will not do it again if I don't have to. But I did it. So in my head, I did what I was afraid of. I did it. And I know how it felt. You know, me crashing into that water, I know how it felt. I know what fear means. But I know that I can do it. And I can do it again. I don't want to do it. I will not volunteer to do it. But if it comes again, I know how it feels. You get it now, right? So, but if you keep going away from your fears, you will never get over it. If you keep your insecurities in front of you, you'll never get over it. You have to face the world heads on with your insecurities. Believe me, people will know that you are the last person who has that insecurity. You were shocked now when I told you I have these issues. But that's what it is. So try and go on. And inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah support you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you.